I believe a strong problem with uh, Bible believers today, or any saved believer, is that they stop growing. So that is the number one most dangerous thing, is that you think you're at a place where God wants you to be. So let me repeat that again. The most dangerous position to be in is that you think that you're at a place where God wants you to be. This is not to <clears throat> make you doubt where God called you or guided you, but the dangerous thing is that we have our pride in the way, which is a problem with Bible-believing pastors and people who don't go to church. So that's a huge problem because they see so much wrong out there. So because of that, they think they got a track record of knowing what's right and wrong. So then they judge a certain scenario where they judge that, and it's a harsh judgment, it's an inconsiderate judgment, and then they make a total mess and mistake. Now, as you're growing in the body of Christ, so if you get to a bigger position, let's say a pastor, or everybody recognizes you, if you make that mess, then how big is the mess to the body of Christ, okay. correct? That's why advanced Christians should also keep this in mind and correct themselves, not just beginning Christians. You always have to do that. To begin our growth, we always have to realize that our flesh is our enemy and the self, okay? Now think about this. It's because of this guy, that's why a lot of people go to hell. Because there's a powerful factor that the Lord gave to you, it's called free will. When you're always thinking about what you want to do, what you want to do, what you freely want to do, you're headed toward a mess of trouble. You have to surrender to God's will, right? But that's the problem. The problem is where you're trying to get out of your own will and try to follow God's will, this guy will always interfere and block God's will upon your life. So when you try to follow God's will, I can guarantee you one thing, okay, if you want to follow God's will. The best thing is your will is not involved in it. That's the best thing best thing is where your will is not involved in it, then you'll know that you're in God's will. Now, the realistic thing is that, let's be honest, there are things in God's will that might, a lot of people won't believe this, but this is true, that can match with God's will. All right, there are things in your will that will match perfectly with God's will. For example, if you look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, if any man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good thing. Yeah. Notice right there, a person's will is, I want to preach for the Lord. Wonderful thing. Yeah. And God's will can be a part of that. Yeah. You notice, yeah. God's yeah. will is aligned with that. Yeah. Uh, of course, not everyone is called to preach. So even if you desire to preach, it may not be God's will, right? So you have to be careful of that. But the point is, there are times that your desire will match up with God's desire. So when those cases happen, as you're checking your flesh, the difficulty for you is, okay, so am I doing this because of pride? Am I doing this because of showing off? Am I doing this to satiate my flesh? So is it lust? Am I doing this for, you know, all kinds of stuff? Now, let's be honest, is that when people get up to preach, there are people, and believe me, I know, there are people who do take it as quite an honor to preach on the pulpit. They do. I don't think everybody in the popcorn preaching at summer camp didn't want to preach. I'm sure there are people that are like, oh, I don't know about preaching and get scared or they didn't want to, yeah. but I'm pretty sure that there were people who wanted to and people who wanted to but didn't get a chance to. Yeah. All right? Those people exist. 
<clears throat> so when people get up there to preach, these things can come to mind. Okay. Now, remember what Pastor Stevenson said, which was a very good sermon. Now, when those get uploaded, then you guys uh, sh should watch it, all right? Amen. Depending on how long the process <laughs> is with, you know, I won't mention names, I won't call them out. You know? <laughs> Yeah, so supposedly I'm supposed to get it uh, t today or yesterday night, but we'll see what happens, all right? But anyway, well, once that thing gets up, then you watch Pastor Stevenson's preaching, but he mentioned about some things that can come into a person's mind where, hey, there are people who are saying, you're a great preacher, and then before you get up to preach, you're like, oh, man, that thing's bothering me, you know? The flesh is saying... You know, you're a great preacher, and you ought to feel guilty for thinking about that. That's pride in you. So how is God going to bless your preaching? So Pastor Stevenson mentioned, I just simply pray that to the Lord, surrender it, and just admit, you know what? I think I am a good preacher. I am a great preacher. And that's just the flesh talking, and Lord, I confess that underneath the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and will you wash it away? Dr. Upman, what he would do is when the devil keeps trying to say to him, you know, you're not really saved, you're not really saved, you're not really saved, and Dr. Upman would try to uh, use scripture, convince himself that he is saved, and when the devil just won't get off his back, then Dr. Upman just says, okay, you're right, I'm not saved, now get off my back. You know? <laughs> so sometimes it's best to just simply accept it, you know what I mean? And then just surrender that to the Lord in prayer. So when these things come in, then you're doubting God's will, right? So, like you've heard, just simply pray that to the Lord. So let the Lord handle it. Just pray it over to the Lord. The more honest you are, unless you're lazy, unless you don't want to take time to think, see that? You have to honestly inspect yourself. So, it's inspecting now, one thing that very much shocked me, I'm a very strange person. I'm sure you didn't know that, okay? But I'm a very weird person. My brain constantly runs, believe it or not. So it doesn't stop. If I were to do yoga for my salvation, i flunk yoga. i totally fail. So thank God that yoga is not a Christian practice, Amen. but a de demonic practice, right? Amen. But my brain just keeps thinking. Like, it dreams. It always dreams. So it just never stops. My brain's just... I don't know how to stop it. So it's weird, okay? So whenever I say stuff or do stuff, I do, I do introspect myself. So I wonder, is this right? Is this wrong? What will the other person think? Is this pleasing to the Lord? Even when I argue, I get my brain thinking. When I uh, started pastoring people or get in charge of taking care of some things, I was very shocked on, wow, people don't really introspect themselves. Now, am I saying that, oh, because I'm better? No, it's because, fortunate you, you don't have my brain constantly running, all right? <laughs> if you have that, then it's a nightmare, all right? It's a nightmare, okay? All, the devil takes advantage of that, right? He just puts stuff in, but... Anyway, that's why it's constantly a battle and a prayer life for me. But I realize that we live in a day and age people don't really think. They just do. They feel something or they do something. That's it. Uh, you have to correct that. You have to correct that. A lot of people don't know this, but Larkin, he mentioned that the thinking process is part of the soul. That's the real you. Soul does thinking. Now, the one that does doing and feeling is flesh. What is this squ square? It won't go away. Oh, well. But anyway, because of that, that's why a lot of people think about this. If they were to honestly inspect themselves when you witness to them, 
and then the feelings of the flesh got offended by hearing the gospel, if they were to honestly inspect themselves, do, do you think it's possible that they probably listen to you more? Do you think it's possible that they might get convicted? Do you think it's possible they might even get saved? That's why we live in a doing-feeling generation. But if everyone started to think for themselves, then they live better. Now, you might say, well, higher ed, don't they have a lot of thinking people, so shouldn't they know better? Ha <laughs> that's the problem, okay? So a lot of people, when they think, see this? It's not just thinking, it's honestly inspecting themselves. When you're honestly inspecting yourself, you know who you're up against? It should contradict this guy, okay? You should constantly critique, attack, battle. I'll tell you what high pompous scholars do. When they use their thinking thing, they never go against their flesh. They think in a way that always supports their flesh. That's why they can defend evolution and atheism to a T. Write PhD papers that uh, put down Christianity. Not because they're so smart, it's because they're so fleshly and wicked and very biased. I mean, that's even revealed in PhD papers. They've done studies on scientists and biases. And sad to say, majority of scientific papers are based on biases. Okay? Even though they boast empirical evidence. Well, it's the empirical evidence that they chose to see, that they chose to do. So, um, the honesty and inspection that contradicts self. When you do that, then do you realize how much of these things aren't going to bother you? So let's even assume that these things are true, okay? If you honestly inspect them, pray that to the Lord and confess that under the blood, then these things shouldn't bother you if they're from your desire that aligns with God's desire. So let me repeat again with the example Pastor Stevenson did. You have a desire to preach. But then you feel guilty because you're like wondering, oh, it's because I'm such a great preacher. I'm better than these guys. So that's why I can preach. Well, that's why you have to do an honest inspection. That leads to prayer. That contradicts this. When you do that, just confess that under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and then just move on. So who cares about these things if they're true? Because those things are true. That's why you confessed it under the blood and you're just moving on. This is where faith comes in. Faith always comes afterward. So this is first, and faith comes afterward. The devil, he'll make you doubt. He'll make you uh, lose confidence in your decisions. He'll make you fear. But you shouldn't do that. If you know that's God's will then you should follow it to a T, 100%, and walk by faith, not by sight. And yeah, even if you do make mistakes, God's not going to beat you over the head. The reason why is because you already inspected yourself. So if you, excuse me, oh boy, that was embarrassing. All right. Uh, no, no, man. No, you, you're, you're contagious. You're contagious, bro. Sorry about that. That was embarrassing. Okay. Yeah, Robert moment. Oh, boy. Anyway, so if, what was I going to say? <laughs> if you inspect your flesh and yourself, God already saw, okay, this child of mine already crucified self in the flesh and already surrendered that to me under the blood and already washed it away. And he's trying to do, follow my will. So, I'm going to beat him over the head and then make him feel so ashamed and just ruin his life and make him think he's not following my will. Does that sound like a good father? No. So, even if you make mistakes, trust the Lord and you go by Romans 8.28. That's why you can still have faith in God. Because in spite of the mistakes you make, Romans 8.28 covers it. But remember, this is after, not before. Okay? This comes first. This is more important. So actually, I make this the greater one. I should do it this way. 
Okay, so honestly inspect yourself first about all these things. Surrender it, pray it to the Lord, and then after that, go by faith on what God is guiding you. Now, what will help you with the honest inspection, where you can see your faults, that way you can prevent yourself from making a mistake, is obviously truth, right? Oop, uh, what happened here? Okay. The Lord's job is to make sure he guides and leads you into all truth. That's found in John 14 and John 16. It's the Holy Spirit's job to make sure that you follow God's will, which is the truth. If you want to find out truth, then what did the Bible say truth is found in, right? So truth is found in the Word of God. So look at the Bible and see if it contradicts the Bible. Here's another one. God gave you a Bible-believing church. He gave you pastors. He gave you people. They help you. They're supposed to teach and preach the truth. So you're supposed to take that into account. Here's another thing. You have to go by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will guide you. Now, a lot of people abuse this one. They confuse that with feelings of the flesh. And that's a huge problem. All right, if you want Holy Ghost guidance, it's pretty simple. It's not going to conflict these things. It's not going to conflict these things. It's always going to follow the Word of God. It's going to follow the same spirit as the, your fellow brethren. Why? Because your fellow brethren have the same Holy Ghost in them. Amen. So if they're leading and being guided by the truth and you're conflating with theirs, then there's something going on. Amen. So you have to check that out. Well, my church is teaching false doctrine. It's doing wrong things. And it's simple. You're not in the right church. So it should be a given that you should be in the right church, okay? Yeah. Once you find a Bible-believing church, the right church God has given to you, and you already know that you have the right book, then these things should follow in line with them. Right. If it's not following in line, then you know something's off. Right. Okay. So let's say there is something going off here. Let's say that something deep down inside your heart, it doesn't feel right compared to what the church and the word of God is doing. Then what do you got to do? Well, what you got to do is if something's conflating, something's off and you need to find what's off. That's where everybody messes up in. Okay? So this guy or this person says, oh, okay, it just doesn't feel right in my spirit with that church and what the Bible says about that, so I'm just, so I get mad at them, I get bitter at them, I run off. Well, then that was a feeling of your flesh. That wasn't the Holy Spirit guiding your heart. That's why charismatics, they're the hardest, sometimes the hardest people to deal with because they're so emotional and they confuse that with the feeling of the Holy Ghost. All right, I don't care how you feel right about it, your feelings are wrong. So that's why you have to find out what's going off here. How do you find what's off? See that? You're not honestly inspecting and praying. When you're honestly inspecting and praying, then you can see some of the problems going on right here with yourself. Now let's uh, take it this way, okay? Let's say there's a verse in the Bible, and then... Some person online pulls up a verse and you're like, oh, okay. And then your Bible-believing church teaches differently from what that person online posted. And you're like, oh, something's off here. Well, a lot of gullible people, they follow what that loser online says because they found a Bible verse on that one. And then when they attend their Bible-believing church, it practices differently. So then they get deceived by that person. But then they find out later on that that online person messed up because some other person online gave, gave a better Bible verse. All right, so something's off here, right? So then who's right, the church or the Bible, and how can I tell? So again, you got to see what's off and honestly inspect and pray. All right, so when you're inspecting yourself, 
oh, there's a Bible verse on that. How do I get around it? Then look at the rest of your Bible. I'll tell you what your problem is. You're not studying your Bible. Oh, no, I study because I watch this, I watch that. I, I keep hearing watch, watch, not read, read. Not memorize, memorize. Not marking, studying, comparing scripture. All I hear is YouTube this, Facebook that, blog post this. Blah, 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 that. See? So you're not really studying or reading your Bible. I would like to ask people who are watching us online, how many times you read through that book? Now, if there are people in the Bible-believing church who read that book more than you, then you think that God showed you something more special than other people? See, so, yeah, that's pretty troubling to me. So you have to what? That's inspecting yourself. You notice right here with that online person, he inspected himself or herself as, my final authority turned out to be online, not the Word of God. Okay. When something's off, Undoubtedly, as Bob Jones Sr. said, the problem is with you. Yeah. You don't blame online. You don't blame deceivers out there. You don't blame your own local church. It's your fault. Why? Because you're not honestly inspecting yourself. So you have to do that. Well, let's assume that you're honestly inspecting and praying, but you don't get an answer. Because God, a lot of times, he don't give an answer like that. Now, when you got into Bible-believing truth, you didn't get an answer like that. Okay. A lot of you, even getting saved, took you lengths of time, didn't it? One miracle in your life, God intervening on your life, step by step until he finally brought you this far to the gospel. Wow. <laughs> Why would God do something like that? He's testing your heart. Amen. See, always the problem is with you. So he wants to see if you're ready to receive the gospel. Oh, that's good. He wants to see if you're ready to accept King James only, dispensational, Bible-believing truth. He wants to see if you're ready for the next stage in your growth, wherever you're going to hit a cross in your life. That's why God doesn't answer prayer immediately, and you should say amen to that. Because if God answered every prayer that you got, think about the consequences. Okay. Aren't there some prayers you're glad that God said no? Yes, yes, yes. Aren't you glad that there are some prayers that God put it at the right timing to answer it? Amen. Not at that moment? Right. Thank you, so that's how God works. He always gives time. So as you're searching for something, oh Lord, give me the answer or give me the truth or show me something. And if you don't get that answer, hey, it's the same thing like when you were lost that time. You didn't get the truth of the gospel like that. God, he probably gave you a couple days later, weeks later, later, or years later as you were searching. Because he's testing your heart, okay? So the best thing is to put it on a shelf. So if there's something you don't know, just put it on a shelf and let the Lord show you further light. Now, I, I live in a day and age where there are so many impatient Bible believers. They always have some doctrine that they want to talk about, and then they spill out their mouth, and then they make a fool out of themselves. Many Bible believers who go into churches, and they say or do something because they're not patient. They're not waiting on the Lord, and they think that's right and that's wrong. And we live, you know why? Because they're so impulsive. They think they already have the answer when they don't. You have to learn to put things on a shelf and wait on the Lord. One of the most dangerous things to Bible believers is overzealousness. Okay. Thinking that you're doing something for the Lord and then you make a big mess. All right? That's why you have to be very careful. You have to be very careful. And how that's done is an honest inspection and prayer. And when you start doing that, then you kind of see. But a lot of people get this. When they do things for the Lord, they really don't check themselves first, do they? When they do things for the Lord, they're like thinking, this is great. This is going to glorify God. This is very spiritual. Oh, this is awesome. And they just go for it. And then they make a big mess. And that's fleshly. That's not God. All right? You have to think about, okay, before you do it, does it? Follow truth. Is it something that follows the word of God? Is it something that will edify the body of Christ? Remember that one with spiritual gifts? Something that the church will be behind you on. 
is the Holy Ghost guiding you to do that. A lot of times you might <clears throat> have these two things. Church supports you and then you find a Bible verse for it, but the Holy Spirit's not guiding you to do it. Let me bring up that example again. If any man desire the office of a bishop, he desire a good thing. Okay, so you have a desire there. You have a Bible verse that supports it. <clears throat> and even your church says, yeah, you got a gift. I, you're called to preach and something like that. But it is possible that the Holy Spirit in you doesn't open up a door or opportunity. See? So then, again, you have to find something that's off. And then go back, pray, honestly inspect yourself. Maybe it's my flesh, not the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's because I fear something. Maybe it's because I'm selfish. Maybe I don't really want to preach when I want to preach. And when you inspect all that, and that's crucified and prayed over, and you realize those aren't the issue, then what you do is, when you pray and honestly inspect, God gives you the answer and says, no, you're not called to preach, even if everybody tells you that you're called to preach. I didn't call you to preach, God said. Then you're in the right. Wow, that's good. See that? But if you don't know, then what do you do? Yeah, that's it. You can wait. wait. You can wait. Wait till uh, God shows it more clearly and you're called to preach. Do you understand how this works? This is very important. These shouldn't conflate each other. Yeah. They should go together. If they're not going together, there's only one problem, and only one. Yeah. And you can't blame it on, well, I don't know much, your lack of knowledge. On, you can't blame it on brothers and sisters in Christ around you, and you become bitter later on when they mistreat you, and they do. But it's still not their fault. You can't blame it on your past or, you know, how your flesh is or your personality or who you are. No, undoubtedly, the problem, as Bob Jones Sr. said, is you. And by the way, let me add this. It's not God's fault, too, so stop blaming God. Well, I honestly tried to do what God wanted me to do and it turned out to be a mess. No, that's not God's fault. That's your fault. Okay? Why? Because you went by impulse again. You just went by doing and feeling. Doing and feeling, doing and feeling. Uh, I keep hearing from Bible believers, Bible believing pastors. It's just so unfortunate, but I just keep hearing them something about God's will, God's will. I believe the Lord's leading me to do this, the Lord's leading me to do this. And it makes me question them are you going by doing and feeling? Okay. A lot of times when they say it's God's will, a lot of times they do doing and feeling. And then later on, because they weren't able to wait, they already made a decision by doing and feeling. Then literally a month or two months later, they realized they made a mess and they went by doing and feeling, not God's will. Okay. Well, then were you lying when you said it was God's will? Uh, either, it's, either you were lying or you thought it was God's will and you didn't inspect this. Those are the only two options. If it turned out it was not God's will, either you were lying about it or you didn't know because you really prioritize this more than this. So you'll, you'll soon realize how safe this thing is. You see this? Yeah. This is almost like your best friend. Yeah. That's good. This is almost like your best friend. They that wait yeah. upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Well, you know, I got to do it. I got to get an answer. I got to get an answer. No, then you'll zap out of strength. You'll cause a mess. You'll gain more strength, more effect, more results for the Lord by waiting on him. And the worst thing you can do is post a video and you say something online and you can't take it back. And you, you set the whole world on fire already and ruin your testimony. The worst thing you can do as a pastor is you get on that pulpit and you say something out of your mouth and then you set the whole world on fire and you can't take back what you said. And you affected other Bible-believing churches around you. Right. One thing you'll notice about Bible-believing pastors, especially when it comes to church problems, and their neighbor Bible-believing pastors and churches with their problems, one thing you're going to notice is they always keep their mouth shut. Okay. You know why they do that? Well, because they're cowards. They don't want to take a stance. No, it's because you're dumb and they're smarter than you. Because they know that 
once they open their mouth and take a position, they can't take it back. So the safest thing is if you're not sure, don't do it. Because the Bible says whatsoever is not a faith is sin. So don't even try, bud. Don't even try. Now, if you honestly inspected and you prayed and get this, you have these things not conflating, then why are you doubting in what you do? And that's from the devil. So you got to crucify that flesh, surrender it under the blood of the Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, and move on. Amen. Some people, Amen. look at this, whatsoever is not a faith in its, is sin. That's a Bible verse, right? <coughs> devil uses that on you. And then he says, well, you shouldn't do it anyway. But you already found a verse in the Bible that supports your position. The devil is just finding a, another verse out there to make you doubt. So if you have a Bible verse, you got the, the support of Bible-believing brethren and the Holy Spirit guiding you to do it, my question to you is, what's holding you back from living out and doing the truth except the devil and your flesh? You better just go out and do it. So let's say you get called upon to popcorn preach. You got the support of the brethren. You got the word of God behind you. And uh, you got the Holy Spirit guiding you. And then why would you get nervous after that? Why would you fear? What's the worst that can happen? The worst that can happen is what? Romans 8, 28, and God covers you and uses you for his glory? That's the worst that can happen. A lot of people um, don't think about this. This is the worst that can happen. Now, you'll notice me saying this quite often in almost any advanced devotional. I, I don't know why people don't get it. And I think the reason why is they don't think, okay? So they're always going by doing and feeling. They don't think, okay? When you make a decision, especially a tough decision, what's very helpful is to... Hope for the best and prepare for the worst. Now, what do I mean by that? What, what I mean by that is there are people who always think about the worst that can happen in their decisions. And those people get nothing done for, for God. They fear every decision they make. They can't do anything. These are the people who even critique other brethren because they're always used to seeing the worst. A lot of times when they're seeing the worst in others, they're seeing the worst in themselves. And they always project themselves when they judge other people. That's one thing I noticed. Oh, so-and-so is doing that because I used to do something like that. How do you not know they're just a different personality from you? <laughs> and that's why they did it that way, even though it's similar to what you used to do in the past. But anyway, I don't know if that made sense to you. But the point is, is that a lot of people, they always think about the worst and then they get nothing done for the Lord. And then they're not confident when God called them to preach. They're not confident when God called them to take a stand. They're not confident when the whole world's up against them and they make a decision that's very crazy, like Abraham. Leave everything you've got and sojourn in a land that I called you to. Why do you have no faith on that? If, especially if these things are not conflating, right? If God, all that supporting you, then go onward for Jesus Christ. So in the worst case scenario, like I've given from the example, what's the worst case that's going to happen after the popcorn preaching? That God's going to use it for his glory and cover your back? Yeah. Especially when you got all these three supporting you? Right. What's the worst that can happen? That's the worst that can happen. So why not go for it then? Think about the best. What's the best? You're the best preacher in the world. <laughs> Oh, well, you know, uh, I, I can't think so lofty and idealistic. There are brothers out there who are better preachers than me. No, no, you should aim. You should aim to preach your very best you can ever give to God. Every man, woman, child, if they have a gift for the Lord, they should not be content with what they got. They got to use it to the best of their ability. Amen. 
This is not about you being the best preacher in the world. It's about, like Dr. Walker said, it's not about the preacher. It's, the, it's not the man. It's the message. Yeah. Yeah. See that? Yeah. Amen. So that's the best case scenario. You gave the best sermon ever. Wouldn't anyone want to give the number one best for the Lord Jesus Christ that yeah. glorifies him? Amen, brother. <clears throat> I, your pastor has a lot of crazy ideas, don't he? We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And then, uh, how did I get online? Because I want to, I do have the intention of not just posting stuff. I want to make sure if anyone goes on YouTube, the very first video they'll see is ours. So that they can see Bible-believing truth and get saved and all that. See that? That's the best case scenario that I'm striving for. But I also have to think of the worst case scenario when I do that. What's the worst case? Worst case is I'll get sucked up like every other YouTuber and Facebooker out there. Onliner. Er, 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 out there. And I'll start to go by algorithms. I'll deprioritize my church. I lose my focus on my family. And I become crazy and weird. So that's the worst case. And that does happen, right? So when I think about worst case and best case, and then I honest, see that? It brings to that honest inspection of myself. When I honestly inspect myself after that, and these are all prayed over, washed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, something I can handle, then I know, okay, guess what? I'm going to go online and do it. But then another person, when they start doing that, they see it as, no, I'm, I'm going to get caught away with that online stuff. So I'm not going to do it. Right. See? So then they make the right decision. Other people, they're not sure. Well, I'm not sure if I should do it, if I should. Right here. <laughs> Until God shows further light. Okay. Now, here's a difficult one. You all know where our church is at. And I'm online. And we had COVID hit. You think that's an easy decision for a pastor to make? You know what anybody would do? They'd shut off online, see? You know what anybody would do? Anybody would probably close down the church, perhaps, if they were online. Oh, it's either or. No, I kept both. Well, how would you do it? You just have to think about the worst case and the best case. So I was thinking about best case. If I can keep two, then my church will grow in spiritual quality and our video content will hit even more since everyone's watching online now. And perhaps more people can find Bible-believing churches and more people will get saved. And how many people during COVID ended up in Bible-believing churches because of that? But if I gave up that vision and dream because I was afraid of what Big Bear, what Big Brother would do, then what would happen to those people? See, that's the problem with Bible believers. They don't dare to be a Daniel. They're too chicken, all right? They're too chicken because they lost their vision, their best. You know what those people tend to do? Bible believers who dare things to do the best, but other preachers who wouldn't dare to do that, they criticize those people. Who do their best. Oh, you're overzealous. Oh, you're not careful. You got to be considerate of your family, your church. And hey, fool, don't tell me what to do when I had that in my mind all that time. Until you pastor here, until you're in my shoes. All right? So, you see, that's why the body of Christ is so divisive. Because there's one group that oversteps their bounds on this or oversteps their bound on that. You got to have these two together. So that's the best case scenario for me. Now, what's the worst case I'm thinking about? What's the worst case? Worst case is, is the internet's going to shut us down. If I'm going to stop the internet, then they're going to shut us down anyway. So why not? <laughs> what's the worst case? Well, the worst case I'm thinking about is, well, they're going to find out about the church and what they do, this and that and that. So because I thought about what they're going to find out, what do I do? I do things where they're not going to find out. See that? So that's how I was able to survive. Amen. So I have to do things in a way where they won't find things to accuse me or they'll find things that 
uh, they'll try to control my life on the way that I pastor. All right? So if anyone's watching this online and saying, oh, Pastor Kim broke the law and the rules, I never said that. <laughs> All right? I never said that. All right? Good luck, okay? So you just don't know what tactics I did. Okay. So anyway, you see how I'm doing this? So why is it that I can preach and teach the way that I do? I always think about worst case. See that? Like I did just now. You, you remember when I was drawing on the whiteboard? And then I was like, you know, Bill Gates barf. Yeah. I was going, you know, stuff like that. Or I was saying, you know, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> Fauci's fungus, you know. <laughs> stuff like that. You know how I came up with ideas like that? Because I thought about the worst case scenario, what's going to happen. If I said the things that I actually said, that other people would, instead of those words that I used, Fauci, Fungus, Bill Gates, Barf, stuff like that, if I didn't use that. So those words came up because I thought about the worst case, what they do, but it's also because of the best case. I want to put the content out. A lot of people don't understand how this works. You have to always think about best case and worst case in your decision. But I think you just don't want to take time thinking about it, praying over it for days and weeks. You just have to do and feel something now. Then what's that? You're flesh and God's not going to use you because you're a fle you'll always go by the flesh rather than the spirit. All right? If you're not a patient person, then God can't use you. Can I repeat that again? If you're not a self-controlled person, if you're not a disciplined person, if you're not a patient person, God can't take you to the next level. People who keep growing and get on the next level can, do, can control this. Do you understand? They always do this. They take time, honestly inspect and pray. Always have to do that. Otherwise, you're going to make a wrong decision either way. You're either going to be overzealous and make a lot of mistakes that hurt yourself and your loved ones, or you're just going to be passive and in danger of doing nothing or in danger of not doing great things for the Lord and being pessimistic of everybody. The, 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 these are the, always the two extremes that I notice in both Bible believers and even pastors and churches. Never end up that way. Always think about best case and worst case. That way you can uh, make the right decisions. All right, as you keep growing, then uh, what you're going to find out is even though you think about best case and worst case, here's a good advice, all right? Humility. You know what I'm sick and tired of hearing, all right? All right. Brother Randall mentioned about people who don't have discerning spirit, right? That's really important. Now, let me tell you the danger with this, okay? And why this is important. Discerning spirits are very important because you'll notice that what we did is discernment. You see that? Yeah. That's true, right? That's the problem with people. They're not discerning. This will definitely help you discern, don't you think so? Especially if you try to find truth and you go by these means. You take time, all right? People are just lazy. They don't want to discern. People just use the excuse, well, I'm not smart like Dr. Gene Kim, so I can't do... Listen, man, I wasn't smarter than you either. Didn't you know that uh, I didn't go to Berkeley like that? I went to community college. And I went to the easiest class and got an F. When I started my job, I was the worst worker. Is that hard to believe? Yeah. <laughs> my parents were scared that I'm like, I couldn't talk to people normally. I didn't know how to talk to people. That was very awkward and weird and people felt uncomfortable talking to me. You know why I am what I am now? Because I went through the worst all these things, these weaknesses, and I constantly kept improving it. 
But see, people don't want to go through that. They always want to go by how they feel, how they do, what pleases them now. They're not willing to make sacrifices, go through great lengths and pain to, to become what God wants them to be. I am now eating the rewards and the fruit of my labor. Okay. Okay. But it takes sacrifice and pain to go through that. So if you want the fruit and the reward from God, you better go through pain first. You got to work on yourself first. I went through a lot of working on myself. Lots. I became what I am because I always did this pattern. See that? Always went by this pattern. So no, I wasn't able to accomplish all this because I'm smarter than you. It's because I'm just as dumb as you. It's because I'm just as dumb as you and I just simply go by what everyone is supposed to be doing. And then you'd be surprised what kind of gifts and talents will come yes. out of you. Yes. What kind of discernment is going to come out of you. Yes. All right, now that, we, now that I've explained that, here's the danger, all right? What, didn't we reach the end? No, that's your problem, all right? Your flesh, okay? You think everything's over, okay? Oh, I'm done, I'm done. <laughs> Stop! Yeah. You're growing. Just because you know the worst and the best doesn't mean you know it all. Right, right, right. Can I repeat that again? Just because you know what the worst and the best is doesn't mean you know it all. Just because you tried all those three means doesn't mean you're right and etc. That's where humility comes in. You always have to keep in mind how, you, how unworthy your flesh is and you can be wrong. Yeah. Or here's another one. You can even be right... But you could have done it better. It didn't come out. The, even though you know something to be true and right, it didn't come out the right way. Right? Have you ever done that in soul winning? That never happened to you, right? You know the truth. They're going to burn in hell if they reject Jesus Christ. So you tell your loved one, you're going to fry in hell for all eternity. Is that true? It's true, but don't come out the right way. You could have done it better. Amen. Uh, see, that's the thing with people, is they don't think about that. Why? It's called constant improvement. You're growing in the Lord. So with that humility in mind, you always have to keep in mind that there's something here I can be wrong. All right, but pastor, I thought you say you got to go by faith and you can't doubt. That's true, but remember what I wrote here? The reason why you can have faith is even with your mistakes, God will cover you. Yes. Amen. Why? Because you will still make mistakes. You know who God uses for his glory? Pe not people who never make mistakes. It's people who do mistakes. Let me translate that for you. He uses imperfect vessels for his glory to carry out his task. What does that mean? They're not perfect vessels. So you've got to keep in mind that you're still imperfect. You're still wrong. Amen. So when you did that task for the Lord, praise the Lord. You used it for the glory of God. But don't think that that's how it always is. See, a lot of people then they come up with this. I'm sick and tired of hearing it is that like, oh, uh, you don't know me. I can discern spirits and I can discern this and what's wrong and right with that. And those guys tend to be the most wacky out of there and even pastors and they said and did things that already shamed the entire body of Christ and the damage is done and they can't clean up their mess after that these are the most judgmental people and the most prideful people because they've exercised it so much they think they know it all that's why I emphasize humility see that you always have to do this. If you always have humility, then what you're going to do is you're going to not let that pride, that arrogance get to you and then tell everybody what to do. You know why you should be humble? A lot of people don't consider these factors. So even though you think about best case, worst case, you go by the word of God, you go by how the brethren support you, you got to go by the Holy Spirit guidance. Here's something that a lot of people don't think about, okay? Are you in your local area? What do you mean by that, pastor? If you go around the world, all right, 
They do things differently than you. So your spiritual convictions is not going to line up with their spiritual convictions. You got to travel around the world more and can't think that everybody revolves around California Bible-believing church. Everybody's got to follow this way. That's not how it works. Then what you've done is you've... Uh, so the Holy Spirit used you for that particular locality for His glory, but you fail to think that the Holy Spirit is using some other locality the way He's guiding them for His glory. So you have to be very be careful. Just because you made the right decision doesn't mean your right decision is going to uh, be everybody else's right decision for them. Spiritual convictions is a big thing. So you have to think about your locality. You have to think about the Holy Spirit using everybody differently. You don't know how the Holy Spirit used them. So shut your mouth and don't tell them what to do. So you have to think about that. I can't believe how many mature Bible-believing people who have lived for God for years still forget Romans 14. I just can't believe it. It's just so immature nowadays. Spirit works differently amongst different people. And another thing you forgot is the flesh is imperfect. Somewhere, get this, unconsciously. Okay, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is you can be prayed up. You can do all those things rightly, the church, the Holy Spirit guiding you, and then uh, the Word of God. But there's some, so you consciously, see, all that's done by a conscious decision, right? But a lot of people don't, they underestimate that flesh. That flesh has an unconscious area where it's habitually in the habit of doing wrong things. Yeah. So let's say, for example, that your flesh, it has a habit of being uh, doing and feeling, very judgmental, very impulsive, okay? So you might be consciously being praying and then looking at the word of God, you got the support of the church and you're going by the guidance of the spirit. And even though you take time and God gave you the answer, okay? And then you're like, okay, so I'm right. Now I'm going to approach that person. So when you approach that person and let's say you rebuke that person and you have every rightful authority to do so and God's all in it, okay? And as you tell that person and approach that person and you deal that person with a one hour or two hour conversation where you point out the faults of that person, are you telling me that within 1,000 to 10,000 words, you're not going to slip up on something? Why? That's called the unconscious fleshly behavior. Your emotion might get worked up in the middle of that argument. And you say something incorrect. No matter how much you prayed up and did all that. Well, that's true. That's true. See that? You know what people are so arrogant to think that, well, I prayed up and, you know, I, I heard some Bible believers doing it. It's making me very sick to my stomach when they should all obviously see the fruits that they've caused so much damage. But they're like, I prayed about it. I even thought about the judgment seat of Christ on that. How dare they say stuff like that? Makes me really think if they're manipulated or if they're, the devil blinded them or they're possessed or something. You know, you got to be very careful of arrogantly coming out like that. So these people, they think that, well, I prayed up, I read the Bible, I got the verses, the Holy Spirit guided me, I got the support of the church for doing it. So what I did was right, and I didn't do anything wrong in that, what, one hour blah, blah, blah that you said, rebuking somebody? Really? 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 Then we should take every word that you have as in, given by inspiration of God. Why won't you say that? That it's perfect, everything given by God. Because if you're totally honest, you know that your flesh is not that great. It has something imperfect there. See that? So you have to realize that. 
well then this sounds contradictory right then how can I go by faith that what I did was right look at it again see this you're not paying attention to that go out by faith but realize that your mistakes can be made in Romans 8 28 also let me add this all right as you go out by faith and you make mistakes you don't just Romans 8 28 it after you're done and you do that by faith go back over here again and say did and then inspect yourself and catch anything over here that you can confess under the blood you know what helped you more by faith is to recognize your weaknesses remember that God it's true that I'm judgmental and I'm prideful and that's true Amen. so I confess underneath the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. but I'm gonna do it anyway because you you led upon my heart to do it Amen. so see that that disclaimer has always got to be there as you're doing things by faith for the Lord if you do that you'll keep yourself in check that's good. when you do that then you grow more in the Lord God can show you more things wow. more truth from his book he can give you more tasks that he can trust you that you will do well on. And the only reason why God didn't give you this higher blessing or this higher uh, level that he take taken you up on and other brethren seem to get more of God's job done more than you or God bless them more than you is because God trusted them and not you. So there must, so you got to check yourself. Amen. All right. Now, don't get me wrong, there are some people, uh, there are Bible-believing churches who have bigger churches out there than others. That doesn't mean that the smaller churches are in the wrong and the bigger churches are in the right. But my point is, is that God, he entrusts more of the task, responsibility, more blessings upon people that he trusts and he knows they'll be good stewards of it. Okay. They don't mess it up. You wonder why God has not been using a lot of Bible believers nowadays in this Laodicean age is because they're not good stewards of what God gives to them. Wow. They keep messing it up due to pride, arrogance. Because you have a past history, like Pastor Stevenson said. Past victories, like Dr. Walker mentioned, of a record of how much you accomplished for God. So in this decision, you know what you did was right. Fooey baloney, you let the flesh win against you. Uh -huh. You think that you just eradicated your flesh? <laughs> That's a false doctrine anyway. That old man will stay with you till the day you die. So never, ever give up on that old man, okay? Keep, keep your eye on that. All right, Father God, I pray that today's teaching was a blessing to the hearers and dismiss us now with your blessing. Bless the fellowship and the meal. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.